Well, it's great to be back in this fantastic building. This is where it all started for me nearly 50 years ago, the chapel of King's College in Cambridge. People know this building all over the world for the beauty of its architecture, the skillfully crafted detail of this Tudor carving, the stained glass windows which cast vivid rays of colour across the limestone, and this sweeping fan vault roof above, which seems to almost float on air. I came here as a chorister back in 1959, and a few years later recorded one of the most rewarding treble solos in the whole choral repertoire, Gregorio Allegri's Miserere. For much of its history, the Miserere has been shrouded with a veil of mystery. Most amazingly of all, though, is the fact that the sound of the piece we're so used to hearing, the piece I recorded back in 1963, which so many of us have grown to know and love, is apparently a very different work from the one Allegri originally composed. So I'm fascinated by the prospect of getting to the very heart of the Miserere and of discovering just how Gregorio Allegri's masterpiece may have sounded in his lifetime. I must have sung Allegri's Miserere several times as a chorister, always under the inspirational guidance of Sir David Wilcox, the director of music here at King's College back in the 1960s. Sir David, how lovely to see you. It's oh. been such a long time. <laughs> oh, Roy, you haven't changed at all. <laughs> I remember being a little bit late for the recording session for this Allegri. Am I right in thinking you had a match that afternoon? I think it was rugby, uh, which I really enjoyed. And I think you were already working with the choir. I remember waiting for you, and you came very apologetic, and uh, not having had a shower, not having lain down or anything, you just came running in there. I'm terribly sorry, but late. So we all moved up to the east end of the chapel, where the acoustic was separated from those in the choir stalls. You could just see the candles, That's I guess. That's right, <laughs> yes, very mysterious. And I said, OK, uh, we're going to start with uh, Allegri's Miseraria. I recall several boys having a go at singing this, but then you finally just sort of said, well, you have a go, and, well, that sounds fine. And I tried not to favour one boy more than another, but for each solo I had in my mind the ideal sound that I wanted for it. And you undoubtedly had the right presence, the right calm, and with recording sessions you can't afford to do it over and over and over again. It's got to be right the first time, and I thought you were the one that was most likely to get it right. I don't think we did it twice, did we? Oh, I, I can't was, remember. I thought it was first go. <laughs> and I was happy to leave it. They said, we better have a covering one just in case. We sang it in English, didn't we? Well, sometimes I've felt we ought to have done it in Latin because the vowels are so much better, particularly for the soloist who has to go up to top C. But it's so important that people listening should hear every word. That particular Psalm 51 is very well known. It raises emotions when they hear the beautiful English sound of that music. Why do you think it became so popular or such a sort of a hit as it seems to have done? Well, I thought it's beautiful. It's high time it were recorded nice. and it sort of caught the public's imagination. I think the Allegra's choice of having the men singing the plain song and the four choir singing the alternate verses and yes. then this distant semi-chorus That's right. singing the other, relishing every last moment so that the listener can sit there bemused and say, gosh, wasn't that wonderful? Let's put it on again. <laughs> <laughs> Well, 
one of the highlights of this piece that a lot of people remember from our recording is this high C towards the end of each of the solo verses. Singing that note in this glorious acoustic yes. was an extraordinary experience because you get some feedback from it as well. Yes. I love the sound of that distant choir taking its time. I've often wondered why no boy ever breathes in the middle of that phrase. It would spoil it terribly. That little scale coming down yes. is, is very difficult for tuning. Exactly, B flat, A flat, yes. And then actually holding the long G after yes. that is probably the hardest thing of all. But exactly. One, two, three, <laughs> four, and it just seems an age if you're yes. beating time. And the look on your face as you sang it, I mean, I don't think you were nervous, because you couldn't have sung it like that if you were. You just enjoyed every moment. There came a time, of course, when I couldn't get those soaring top notes anymore and had no choice but to say goodbye to the choir of King's College. Since then, my musical career has taken me all over the world, both as a solo violinist and as a conductor, and I've lost track of the number of recordings I've made. And yet there is one recording which is never far from me, that 1963 recording of Allegri's Miserere, which captured my voice at the tender age of 12. It's never been out of the record and CD catalogues and is regularly played on radio stations all over the world. In fact, the latest version of the recording carries the accolade of being described as a legend. I'm not quite sure whether that's referring to me or the recording. Just a short walk down the road from here outside King's is another Cambridge college, St John's College, also famous for the standard of its chapel choir. They're going to be singing the Miserere next week as part of their BBC Radio 3 Ash Wednesday Choral Evensong. And I gather that right about now, Dr David Hill, the director of music at St John's, is in the song school rehearsing with the chorister who will be singing the solo this year. Perhaps they will be able to begin shedding some light for me on the real Allegri Miserere. David, what is the special connection between this piece and Ash Wednesday? It's a very fitting start to this season of Lent. I mean, it's a long psalm. 20 so, verses, in fact, I, I think. Indeed, yeah. in a sense of pleading. Uh, there is that sense of sorrow almost within the text. You know, have mercy upon me, O God, after thy great goodness, according to the multitude of thy mercies, do away mine offences. You know, we are on our knees at this time. And how is that sense of penitence reflected in the music? It's in the key of G minor, a dark key, and then he uses the rich sonority of five parts to begin the piece. And so on, and it, once that is finished, the tenors and basses sing the plain song verse. followed by the famous section. So, Quentin, you're singing that at the service uh, yes. this year. Do you get nervous in advance? Well, everyone gets nervous when doing solos, and this is the big piece which every chorister wants to do. Is, is there something special about that top C? Well, yeah, I mean, it's a very high note. And it's quite rare for a chorister to get it really well in context with the breathing. David, you seem to have your house well in order here. The boys are very cool. I think, as Quintus has described, it's something which they all like to try and do. But it, as you well know yourself, it's a very difficult moment. Yet this version, which we normally hear in this country, is actually very anglicised, isn't it? Yes, it is, because although we know that Allegri composed the Miserere around 1638, the piece we've become familiar with in this country and which you've recorded was, in fact, manufactured as recently as 1951. Right. So when Sir Ivor Atkins, who was for many years organist of Worcester Cathedral, made what can only be described as a patchwork version from all the various sources available to him so that Allegri's music could fit into the business of the Anglican Book of Common Prayer and Evensong and so on, and the right. translation of Psalm 51. But for example, we start with one source, and quite soon 
Here's another one. Followed by yet another one. And you see, it's a really quite a patchwork quilt here. So then, then the moment is another source. And so on. Everyone knows I what happens after that. I remember that bit rather well, yes. <laughs> That's right. Ironically, one of the parts of Ivor Atkins's edition, which may never have existed, I'm yes. afraid, Roy, is that top C. Oh, dear. <laughs> well, that's something of a surprise, to hear that the tingle factor of those soaring top Cs, which for me is the highlight of the Miserere, may well not have been there in Allegra's original at all. So to discover the real Miserere, I'm going to have to travel a little further than the cloistered colleges of Cambridge. I'm going to have to travel to Allegri's birthplace, to the Eternal City, to Rome. As we drive around these streets with the hustle and bustle of people going about their lives, it strikes me that this city couldn't be further from the serenity of the miserere that I recorded. But this is actually where Gregorio Allegri was born in 1582 and the city in which he spent all of his life, dying here in 1652. But as we pass the Colosseum, that magnificent monument of ancient Rome, this is still essentially the city that Allegri knew in the 17th century, with its history, its architecture and its love of life. I'm here to find Andrew Parrott, conductor and musicologist, who's been researching the music of Allegra's period and has himself recorded the Miserere with his tavola consort. And he's going to be my guide through its history. Andrew's asked me to meet him here at Chiesa Nuova, the new church. It's a majestic late 16th century building standing on a typical bustling pedestrian square in the heart of Rome with only its grey façade visible and in fact today it's covered in scaffolding and apparently it stands at the place where there was once a wide-mouthed cave said to be an entrance to hell but I'm hoping this doorway will just simply lead us into the church. What a wonderful church. Isn't it? But it's not the architecture and the paintings that I brought you here for, it is this. This is a tomb, is it? Yes. The inscription says, Cantores pontifici ne quos vivos concors melodia junxit mortuos cobras and so on and so on. So. Well done. <laughs> Which translated means the papal singers, anxious that those whom melody united in life should not be separated in death, wished this one tomb as their burial place. So you know, this was the official church of the singers in the papal chapel, and Allegri, amongst all his brethren and colleagues, is He's actually there. buried here. Presumably, yes. there's not a separate tomb for him there. It's a collective. And were they, I mean, were they like a secret group, a secret <laughs> society? Well, they were very protective of themselves, and they were regarded as the top dogs. They specifically regarded themselves as guardians of an ancient and purer tradition of church music. Well, clearly, Andrew, that the papal choir was a very tightly knit group, but what do we actually know of Gregorio Allegri's connection? Well, he joined relatively late, I think in his late 40s, when he was 48, 49, in 1629. He had various church jobs before that and had been a boy singer in one of the other Roman churches, so had a thorough musical training. And like many other singers in that choir, he was a composer. That relationship between what they composed and who performed it was, was wonderfully so close. So other people in the choir composed music Absolutely. that they sang? And that was a long tradition, yes. There was an engraving from the early 18th century, but we have no colourful details about his life. He was one of several very respected musicians. And so it was for this close-knit community that Allegri wrote this wonderful Miserere, which they clearly kept as a great secret between themselves. It was explicitly for this group. Whether they kept this particular piece any more secret than others initially, I don't know, because right. they kept everything <laughs> a secret. And uh, Why? Was, uh, because they wanted to be special, and they were special, in that they were guardians of an ancient tradition, a purer tradition of church music that was always in danger of being corrupted and updated, and of course that's precisely what happens to the piece. So how, how do you think the papal choir kept their repertoire such a secret? 
Well, the music was improvised to some extent anyway, so in one sense it doesn't exist and no one can copy it easily, but also they could put around rumours that if you did copy it and take it elsewhere, that that was an excommunicable offence. February day outside, but we've come into the warmth of this bustling Italian cafe here in Rome, drinking cappuccino. And it's good. <laughs> we've been surrounded by tourists everywhere, I guess, taking in the great sights, such fabulous architecture all around us to see and presumably something people have been doing throughout the centuries. Oh, absolutely. Particularly in the 18th century, it was almost the epicentre of the Grand Tour, at least the place people headed for, because they would stop off at Venice en route and things like that. But this is a living history lesson. There's no one place which has so much of its past clearly visible and accessible. And instead of coming for a short period of time, they would be here for a month, two months sometimes. And what would have drawn them here? I mean, what would be the highlights? Well, obviously the, the classical architecture and, and ruins, the wonderful churches from the Renaissance and the Baroque. But musically, a highlight undoubtedly was what they would have heard as part of the papal ceremonies, particularly if they could organise their lives to be here in Rome in Holy Week. And presumably the fame of that would have spread throughout Europe and acted as a sort of magnet to draw people here. That's right. People wrote letters back home describing how wonderful it was. And also people published tourist books. If somebody says it's almost impossible to go to Italy without writing a tourist book afterwards and that means that we have descriptions of people who actually heard Allegri's Miserere in Rome. And that would include some famous people I guess. Certainly Hazlitt, Goethe, Charles Dickens and of course Mozart. He was here as a 14 year old brought by his father Leopold and as a pianist he would have been showing off his talents to the assembled aristocracy in particular and while he was here he heard Allegri's Miserere. But the 14 year old Mozart didn't merely hear the piece he wrote it down. That was not meant to be done. He transcribed it. He just listened to it. Just do it twice. He went back and made a couple of corrections on the Friday, having heard it on the Wednesday, and therefore created a copy of this jealously guarded piece. Leopold, of course, as you can tell from the letters, was very proud of his son for having done this. We went on Wednesday and Thursday in fine weather to the Sistine Chapel to hear the Miserere during Mass. You have often heard of the famous Miserere in Rome, which is so greatly prized that the performers in the chapel are forbidden, on pain of excommunication, to take away a single part of it, to copy it, or to give it to anyone. But we have it already. Wolfgang has written it down. The manner of performance contributes more to its effect than the composition itself. So we shall bring it home with us. Moreover, as it is one of the secrets of Rome, we do not wish to let it fall into other hands, so that we shall not incur the censure of the church, now or later. But it wasn't just Mozart who heard it. Mendelssohn did too in 1831, and he gives us a very, very full description of the whole occasion. It was almost dark in the chapel when the Miserere commenced. I clambered up a tall ladder standing there by chance, and so I had the whole chapel crowded with people, and the kneeling Pope and his cardinals, and the music beneath me. It had a splendid effect. The Miserere begins pianissimo. This is to me the most sublime moment of the whole. You can easily picture to yourself what follows. The Miserere of Allegri is a simple sequence of chords on which either tradition or what appears to me much more probable some skillful maestro has based embellishments for exceptionally good voices and more especially for a very high soprano. These embellimenti always recur on the same chords and as they are carefully composed and beautifully adapted for the voice it's invariably pleasing to hear them repeated
And one of the most interesting sources in many ways is from Charles Burney, English music historian, composer... Traveller and diarist, I remember, some wonderfully evocative descriptions of his journeys. The fascinating thing is that he was here in Rome, but not in Holy Week, so he never heard this piece. But he made friends with one Santarelli, one of the Pope's singers, and Santarelli was a historian of the chapel choir itself, and he gave Burney a copy of all the music for Holy Week. And, of course, when Burney got back, as a good Protestant, not in danger of being excommunicated, was able to publish the whole thing. So we have the first printed source, 1771, in England, a very important sort of landmark in the history of this rather complicated piece. Well, I think we've been probably following a lot of the tourists. We're uh, mingling with quite a lot of them here in front of this fantastic building. It's the Basilica of St. Peter's and the Vatican, possibly one of the most famous facades and buildings in the world, the very heart of the Roman Catholic Church. Andrew, I suppose we're, we're actually now close to the very place where this Miserere was first performed and, and composed. But those tourists would not have been heading into St. Peter's up there. They would have been going past the Vatican Library where the scores that we have that have survived uh, of this uh, Vallegris Miserere are kept and jealously guarded right. and making it very difficult for us to get our hands on them, uh, not on display for the general public. They would have been going round the corner, half a mile or so, to the Pope's private chapel, the Sistine Chapel. Well, we've made this long journey through all those amazing corridors of the Vatican Museum, full of artefacts, sculptures, paintings, just overwhelming, and finally we find ourselves in the Sistine Chapel. I suppose this space is about the same size as the banqueting house in Whitehall. It was built on the proportions in the Bible of the Temple of Solomon, so it's actually a rectangle, but the origins are a bit obscure. It takes its name from Pope Sixtus IV, late 15th century, but it had existed before that and there were all sorts of structural problems they had to deal with. But the big process of creating what we see now began in the 16th century and Michelangelo was commissioned in 1508 to start this amazing series of frescoes. It occupied him for above 30 years of his life, often against his will, because he really wanted to be sculpting, not painting. One of the things that really strikes me is their perspective. The, the scenes and the figures get larger as you go up. And dead centre, right above you in, in the chapel, is the most famous, the creation of man, the creation of Adam. The, the, the two hands almost touching and sparking life. And the eye is inevitably drawn to the last judgement, which is on the wall behind the altar and the amazing sky blue. There's this seemingly very small gallery. How many singers do you think they could have got in well, there? Well, <laughs> people were smaller in those days, allegedly, but the official number on the books was about 30, 32 sometimes. That's a lot more than they could have sung Abs together in, in that space. With any comfort, but on a relatively ordinary day, half that number sang. Um, and sharing on, one copy of music? Yes, they are all reading from this same big manuscript on the lectern. <laughs> But the only way we can really get any closer to how the Miserere might have sounded in Allegri's time, or indeed in the following centuries, is to understand exactly how the papal chapel choir worked, the traditions of performance. In particular, the singers of the papal chapel choir at Allegri's time were trained in improvising to elaborate the music they had in front of them, and indeed to improvise without any music in front of them. Not just for virtuosic display, but to make it more expressive. It's not very dissimilar to the way jazz musicians work. They have a framework, they have a structure, they know the chords, the harmony, the basic tune, but that's only a starting point. They then know how to make the piece their own. So, what Allegri has written is really very, very simple. In your excellent performance, Roy, you have the notes in front of you. The ornamentation has been written down by somebody, inherited from somewhere, and that is sung beautifully in a very stately fashion. But that must be quite different from the way, if you like, hot-blooded Italians, on the spur of the moment, found exactly the right ornaments to suit that dramatic, emotional moment. The whole feeling in the building must have been so different on those candlelit dark nights of Holy Week. Absolutely. The offices are called tenebrae, shadows, and they happen at dusk. So the natural light is, is fading, and all the candles are, one by one, extinguished. 
And this was the moment everyone was waiting for, just as we've heard Mendelssohn describe, that some endured the two hours of chant for this moment. But after all that, the Pope prostrate on the floor, a short silence, then that magical moment when the Sistine Chapel Choir sings the Miserere. That's such a different sound from my recording. There's so much more vibrancy in the music and, and passion and emotion in the singing. Ultimately, of course, we'll never really know how the original would have sounded, but there are new ideas from musicologists all the time, and the truth is that every original version is, just like your own recording, Roy, a construct of its own time. Allegri's original Miserere, or was it? The presenter was Roy Goodman and the producer in Manchester was Simon Vivian.